Uh, hi, uh, welcome back to the Blueprint Bite Size Blether. I still can't say that. Um, James Wade here, Senior Game Development Manager, and I'm joined by... Um, I'm Sarah Hogwood, I'm a School Rugby Officer and involved in the Girls Futures setup. Hello again, I'm Scott Riddle, Game Development Manager for Caledonia Midlands. Excellent. And basically over the next kind of 15, 20 minutes, we're actually going to talk about another blueprint element. And we're going to talk about changing challenge. Um, yeah, so the blueprint, we have loads of games and we talked about learning environments last time. And we're going to look at a kind of couple of coaching tools and what that means to us in terms of how we kind of change things in a session to make sure that whatever we're doing is bringing value to the players. So got a lovely graphic up here of our core games represented by the Apple and some symbology that represents some of the games. But Scotty, you were kind of big part of kind of building the blueprint. Um, what's, can you tell me a bit more about the games and what kind of the principles behind them and why they're in there? Yeah, so, so core games, we wanted to provide a few guidelines and a bit of consistency on a framework to design games. Um, we have a number of multi-direction games. We have a couple of games that involve like ball security, looking after the ball, uh, transfer, fending. A number of games that can be used to develop you know, principles of play where we would have a contest for possession um, at the breakdown potentially and we also have a number of games that that look at attacking space so um, obviously that would include running passing and kicking and and decision making within we just want to have a, a wee bit of a theme to the games and that would be you know Scotland so each has a has a connection to our country and all games can be adapted pretty easily to achieve a number of outcomes um we're really keen to have you know we've, we've got eight and with that brings choice so players could potentially get used to these games they could be delivered in clubs schools you know adult youth mini ad adaptations and yeah there's there's a lot of options in there which and options are good i probably should have put a different wallet picture up truth be told Nah, yeah, that's Wallace, <laughs> Wallace and Gromit. And Gromit's not part of it, unfortunately. But yeah. So, yeah, Wallace Ball would be focusing on the ball movement massively, um, trying to think about catch and passing skills, one-touch turnover focus, so real challenge on, on sighting passes, making split-second decisions, and you know being creative about how we move the ball. So oh, cool. That sounds good. And these games have obviously been a big part of kind of the blueprint. Sarah, great to have you here. So you've obviously coached, played on all sorts of Scottish rugby so just talk us through like how do you use games in your sessions what's what is the best thing about it but also like some challenges that you find when doing games as I well. think some of the challenges we find with games is that the players tend to get quite hung up on the rules that we want them to play with so yeah. if we've given them a sort of template of the game they can get quite hung up on you know what that looks like and if the other team aren't doing what they should be doing mm -hmm. rather than actually you know what can we develop and what can we create with playing the game um, I really like Skyball just because there's so many opportunities and kicking something that, you know, working with the likes of the Futures Girls is something we really want to develop. Um, so I, I really like that because you can add so many layers to it as well um, and it gets players thinking about doing different skills, you know, kicking, for instance, under more pressure than they might be used to or players that aren't accustomed to kicking yeah. have to kick because they're the one in space that, you know, has got the opportunity to do it. Yeah, so yeah. I really like that's one of my favourites to coach at the moment. Which is your favourite, James? Out of the games? Yeah. I like the one that's got the, uh, I think it's Wallace Ball with the one touch turnover. So you're an attacking team has five or six phases, but when the ball transitions, that the, the team now in possession only has one phase to try and get as far out the pitch as possible. And I think it just brings a real cutthroat attacking mentality. Players really focus into like how can we keep the ball alive and how we can move up the pitch. And you saw it with the uh, do hands try versus England. Possession kicked away. Do hand, you've got one phase to use. Turns out he needed zero the length of the pitch but i think it just provides a real kind of real attacking mentality sometimes we can talk about some real like we talk about rules for like must pass twice or look for kick but i think it just allows players to explore what that is i think so it's like, like like tactically as well if yeah. if you can be real decisive and energetic off that first instance as the defense is organizing then it gives you an opportunity to to play so as a as a principle it's you know can be transferred easily into you know, 15s or, you know, other other formats of the game. Sevens, you want to say sevens, don't you? 
I, I, yeah, well, yeah, maybe, yeah. So it is important. In some I think but. two hands try was a really good example of what the game looks like when you aren't getting hung up on a, you know, it's one try, one touch turnover. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's a case of just, just play it. It's, it's possible. It's a good, good example of what it actually looks like. Definitely. So I hope people see lots of these things come out in training sessions up and down the country. People trying to go from any sort of kick receipt, which would be brilliant. In their um, own half. In their own half. In their own half. Why not? Um, so. One of the things I find quite difficult with games is actually that because you're coaching to everyone, it's actually bringing value to each individual player, getting the level of challenge right. So I think that's kind of like the purpose of the next bit of the conversation. We're going to talk about something called step and how we can use different constraints, different coaching tools to kind of bring different challenges. So we've got this nice little thermometer here. So this is a challengeometer, which was, which was taken from Positive Coaching Scotland. And um, essentially, it's just kind of painting a picture about how we kind of challenge players, what's too much challenge and maybe elic elicits a bit of panic, what's actually too easy and how we kind of get that sweet spot of learning. So, yeah, it's something they're always trying to do. Um, Scotty, so when you're coaching, like what sort of things are you seeing and hearing that kind of gives you a bit of an indicator about how players are navigating this th thermometer? Like, what, 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 kind of, what does panic look like in a session to you and how do you kind of deal with that? Yeah, I think I'd look at how many mistakes were being made, yeah. whether there's a lot of drop balls or... Um, you know, there's there's probably measurables that you could maybe look at within that, but also like how comfortably are the, the players problem solving? Are they communicating to each other? Are they asking questions? Are they sort of working out the way to to score within the game potentially? Yeah. And are they collaborating? Are they working as a team? Are they able to have time for decision making? Mm -hmm. I think um, a lot of the constraints that we can apply to the game can be based on increasing time for decision making or decreasing the time for decision making. So, you know, if if players are are understanding, you know, what they're wanting to achieve, and you're giving them time to process it, I think that's that would be that certainly would be a measure. There's something about processing. Now. Do you think that as coaches we need to jump on right? If there's loads of mistakes, we need to jump in and intervene or. What are your thoughts on that? Or do you reckon we sometimes need to let things play out and see what players? I, I'm a big out? fan of just letting it play out because I yeah, think yeah. if we step in all the time, they don't get a chance to actually think for themselves. And at times, yeah. you want certain people to, to step up and be the leaders or decision makers on the team. So, and also when they're playing a game, the coaches aren't on the pitch feeding them information. You yeah. know, we've taught them everything that we can, and it's it's down to them to to manage and ultimately play that game. Definitely, I think there's something about I've I've tried plenty of games where the players have initially been in that panic zone when you give brand new rules you talk about getting focused on the rules and actually sometimes letting it play out to see what they figure out sometimes you might come back to that game a week after i think the number of times i wanted to abandon something completely because it's been like oh my gosh that was an absolute disaster but actually like just just let them figure it out and get have another go and one of our core games that we've used in the past uh, at the university is kind of like developed that way it was actually a bit of a horror show to start with but the players really bought into it and now it's 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 a core game that they really love, um, and like same with comfort zone, isn't it? It's, it's the other way around, isn't it? Like we always like no drop passes or like make sure we hit everything. Well, actually, if everything's being connected, then are we really challenging the players? And you can probably do quite, quite a lot of engagement that way, can't you? So trying to get that sweet spot is actually something that's pretty difficult. Yeah, it's, it's knowing knowing your players as well. Are they where are they and you know age and stage or you know, how are you trying to pitch this session? Do you have certain sessions that will deliberately, explicitly go into a stretch zone a little bit more? That it's being clear with the players on your rationale, your why, your, you know, involvement with them in, in understanding and, and giving them a bit of empowerment on their own development. So, you know, it's not just trying to chuck in a, a game for game's sake or a, a skill for skill sake. It's more based on a like, decision-making approach. I like that. It's always just like pre-mortem, I think, is the term that's been used. Like, this is going to be a really difficult session game. Don't worry if there's loads of mistakes because the intention is to really push you. I think that's a really important thing. Sometimes we can just drop things in. It's like, oh, what's going on? Actually just telling them, like, this is the purpose. Which comes on to this little graphic here. So those of you who've been on our aspiring coaching courses will be well familiar with this. And we tried to put together basically a bit of a, um, a mind map of how coaches can look at the game and decide what's going on. So so you've obviously had a quite a few uh, deliveries on, of the course. 
what kind of stands out for this for you? How easy do you find this to use? How do you use this kind of, I suppose, mind map? Mind map. I think, I mean, it's it's pretty simple to use. You know, there's the, the, the big yes, no box. So you're usually pretty quick to decide if it, you know, if it's working or if it's not. Yeah. Um, I like, you know, if we can increase the difficulty of the game, you know, if we start off with the, sort of that, that bog standard game or that, that template of a game and then, you know, increase the difficulty by adding different layers to it. But I think going back to Scott's point on getting to know your players, like the players will start asking questions about, can we can we do this? Can we do that? Or, you know, game. I want to try this or yeah. I want to try that. And it's a case of, yeah, go for it. You know, if you want to sort of develop the game um, based on what you're seeing, then go for it. Um, rather than and me as a coach going, right, we're going to do X, Y and Z. So I, I like that one in terms of increasing the difficulty. And I think some players are quite um, in tune with scenarios. So yeah. they, they like having a scenario or, you know, it just it adds to the pressure or the intensity of the, the session or that area, that section of the session when you say, you know, this is our scenario, this is what we want to try and achieve. And then obviously that adds into the, right, did we manage it? And, you know, did it, did it work out as well as we, we hoped it would? I'm really bad at putting a scoring system in and not actually keeping up with the score. And then yeah. players are like... What's the score? I'm like, oh, um, you guys are winning, I think. But I think it's really important because players actually really buy into that. Like, where, where are we and how can we beat our mates on the other side? Do you tend to navigate this? Do you tend to, like, drop difficulty things on the hoof or do you kind of wait for natural breaks? Or what's what's your preferred kind of way of increasing difficulty slash reducing challenge? I think I'm a big one to wait and see how it plays out. And then yeah. there's, if there's something that I'm seeing that's not quite working, I'll throw something in. Or again, if the, if the players ask questions, it's a case of, well, yeah, you know, let's throw that in. Or, you know, any constraints that, that you would want to throw in. Um, they're quite good at coming up with a constraint that would benefit their team, but not necessarily the other team. So when you say it's, it's for both teams, you get a few funny looks, but then it just means they've got to think a little bit more about, right, something that'll benefit us that the opposition can, can use as well. Definitely. Well, I think that brings us nice on to kind of this menu. So we put together this very handy kind of guide on like different things you can do to a game or an activity to make it easier and harder. It conveniently means step, which you can step up or step down. I'm sure that was purposely done. So um, yeah, so basically we talk about spa changing space, the task, the equipment and the people to kind of achieve different outcomes. And I think this is where you can get really creative as a coach. Scotty, the king of constraints, Scott looks after our PDH hub and the rules and you've been looking at some scenarios of constraints recently, haven't you? So which do you find the most exciting kind of part of step and give me some of your favourite ways to use constraints and, and or changing the challenge? Yeah, I think I'm, you know, a huge fan of step. I think it gives coaches a really good framework to adapt their sessions to achieve outcomes. Um, I think identifying what the outcomes are as Sarah was just alluding to is is knowing your players and knowing their age and stage and knowing what we want to achieve by a program um I, I do like you know being relatively organized for a session so it's understanding you know how much space do you have mm -hmm. is it is, is that going to be a limiting factor linked to like decision making time um is this area appropriate for what we're looking to achieve? Do we have enough room for a backfield to have to work hard enough so they have to defend space and then you know make decisions on whether we're kicking the ball or not potentially? Um, but I think the the biggest one for me would be task. Yeah. Is is you know once once we get into that, we can tinker with tasks endlessly through games. Um, the the interventions of a coach should be for the benefit of the players. So does one, you know, just changing one task or constraint at the breakdown, for example, if one player makes a touch to have to do a pancake or go down and up. What's a pancake? A pancake would be on your tummy, on your back, on your tummy, and then up as you would cook a pancake. So or, a, or a sugar cookie. I've heard it called a sugar cookie. Yeah. So I think what's it with pancake show Tuesday next Tuesday, I believe. Yeah. So yeah, very very on point with that. <laughs> very so on point. that that then allows, you know, rewards the attacker for maybe getting in between two defenders yeah. and creates, you know, two players off their feet. So we're then talking about people now as well. So it has an effect on the numbers on feet at the, the time in that game, which then hopefully gives the attack more reference to play to space. So again, it's, you know, I think we're, we'll chat about it in a second, you know, what we must do and can't do. So what would, like, how would that, link in with that 
it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because we want to kind of, I suppose with tasks and constraints, we want to nudge players to certain behaviours and certain things. So if you go back to that flow chart, like is the game intending, is the is the game intending its outcome? I, yes, that's what I was meant to say. So if it is, if it isn't, can we nudge them towards it? And sometimes it's easy to go, you must do this. So for example, if you want to play wide, you must pass twice on each breakdown, mm -hmm. which achieves the getting wide part, but you sometimes miss opportunities. So, but for example, you might just create a 10 who's get used to look, looking for the pass there, I've been looking there without actually scanning what's kind of like in front of them. So there's a different way, even though we want them to nudge them to play the ball wide, we still want to afford opportunity for them to make a decision. So instead of saying that, we can almost go, right, if the 10 gets touched, it's a turnover. So you put a bit of jeopardy on them, maybe taking it to contact, but actually there's a whopping great hole in front of them. That's the decision to be made. Absolutely. The big one for me would be like, we must make two passes from a breakdown. Yeah. You encourage two passes, but yeah. you still want to attack. If there's a, a glaring hole in front of you, then we need to run into that. That's so. I think that language around it is really important because if you, you say to some players, you know, you've got to think about making two passes, that's all they'll think about. So mm. as you're saying, like they'll maybe forget about what's in front of them yeah. because they get so hung up on the, the two passes. So it's, I suppose it's that language around how you how you say that to them. So it's not a do or don't, but it's, you know, how else can you put it? It's like best best pass, isn't it? Something like, you know, risk best reward. Decision. Like you, you every time yeah. you touch the ball, you have a decision to make. Yeah, definitely. So that would then be into, you know, maybe constraints on people where, where uh, if this player is allowed an extra touch before they must go to deck and play the ball. So suddenly how do their teammates utilize their constraint on that individual player so then there's mm -hmm. there's problem solving um we may be adding some equipment focus where the, the pitch is split up into some different zones that some players are only allowed there for a second or you know for a period of time and then they must or you know they must try and stay connected or they i don't want to say can't go in a zone but i think there's there's a better way to describe it potentially to them Scoring system is quite a way to do that, because you can reward certain behaviours more than other things you maybe want. So actually, in a certain zone, you might score more points for scoring there than in another one. So even though you, you, you're not saying you can't, but actually, it's probably beneficial for you to maybe go in there. But um, I like the use of um, that multiple touches on certain people as a good way for differentiation, that step can be used actually within a game. Touch games tend to be lend themselves to quicker, more, di more evasive players. But actually, if you've got a player who's... Really want you, you really want to come to them to get forward, and I've seen you use it really well, like a superpower. Like it's going to take three touches to stop a certain player, and it really empowers that player to get the hands on ball and go forward. And actually, say gets the teammates figuring out actually we've got a bit of an asset here. How can we kind of figure that out? But we could talk all day about this because this is where you can get really creative um, around it. Fortunately, we've actually done a bit of work, haven't we? So for each game, we've put together a few little step things you can try. Um, and we've talked about spice levels, so making it mild so it's a bit more comfortable, getting spicy and into red hot, and then eventually some of the games we will reference this wee little fella down in the right-hand corner, too hot to handle. Um, have you tried some of the spice levels in the games and what your thoughts on them and how yeah, they kind of Yeah, so we, we started off with sort of that, that too hot to handle one week um, just to see what the players would do. Uh, based around the blueprint game so they had an understanding of what the game was but we just kind of threw everything at them to see how they would cope yeah. um, and I suppose it's known, knowing your players and knowing who's likely to, to react in which way um, but then sort of the, the following week we went down to that mild level and you had the players stand there you know asking if they could do this or they could do that because that's what they'd done the week before so I think it's a, it's a good way of challenging players and I think simplifying it or going back to the simpler versions of the game is also the bigger challenge because they're so accustomed to be under under the pressures of that too hot to handle level definitely they do enjoy it though don't they Which yeah I like the I like the theme and I think coaches always want to try and nudge towards you know the the, sp the hotter versions of the game or the spicier versions of the game but could we could we then add in you know a scoring system where we try and score a number of points that we've we've not potentially scored before in in a mild game you know hike ball potentially where mm -hmm. we're trying to make you know as, as many touches as we can mm -hmm. per player which means that each player has made a conscious decision whether to pass or or run through the game and that that might have more of a benefit than 
adding in more challenge for, yeah. for challenge sake. You mentioned it as we're doing the kind of preamble before we started recording about uh, a coach who, rather than putting a prescribed time on a game, when like we're not going to stop until you reach a certain score. Is that right? Like forty points or something like that. Yeah, I so think. Could be quite a good yeah, way so the, the yeah the the scoring systems can be I think probably the most powerful way yeah. of engaging players because. We, we want players to be competitive. We don't yeah. want winning to be the be all and end all. Um, we want scoring systems to add, you know, additional pressure and a bit of jeopardy potentially on risk reward. If one team is losing, what do they need to do to, you know, get a foothold in the game? Or if one team is winning, how do they change their their tactics to either, you know, go ahead and win that game that might be first to first to forty points or. Um, I think it, it just adds an extra extra layer. Yeah, I think it definitely it kind of focuses training and we talk about training, preparing place for games and having that focus of scenarios and scores is really important. I think one thing to kind of note with the spice levels is that if you make it harder for the attack, invariably you make it easier for defence and vice versa. So just being aware that, isn't it, in games you might want to just play around with that balance because we talk about a big thing in the blueprint is actually that defence focus and getting the ball back. And I know in the past, well, I'm really guilty of making it easier for the attack because that's what my bias is like. I really, I want really good attack to make me feel better about my coaching. But it's actually, how we, can we kind of make sure that balance is struck? It's, it's handing it over to the players as well because if they can identify why they're maybe not being successful in a game, then what do they need to change within their attack? Or what do they need to maybe address within the defence? Could they... Um, change something that the defence, which allows them, you know, a chance to get back in the game. For example, could they maybe make more defenders go off their feet at the breakdown? Could they not allow defenders for a certain period of time to go in a zone, which they can then attack, which then maybe opens up space in behind a front line of defence or a corner, or they add in a they add in a task. So we're handing it over to them with step that if they kick the ball and it bounces out they get the ball back like a, a 50-22 potentially so I like could, ones that you can steal players certain things you can steal players from the opposition it's kind of like yeah just again who would you target who I, would you try and get back I think that's a big thing is giving the players that control over yeah. sort of step and the, the spice level because then they really buy into what you want to do Definitely. Um, and I often find that they'll come up with constraints that you know maybe we haven't thought of or you know something that we, we maybe wanted to get them to that point but they, they, they've come up with it before that and it's kind of that theme from the learn play that we had the other other week about coaches with less in control and giving more to players and actually how often do we talk to our players about right this is a game we're going to do how where do you want to go with this here's some options think about it and go from there but i've enjoyed the blether it was a <laughs> great, great blether great, great blether. blether really good so um yeah thanks for listening in um so basically check out the blueprint resource which is we have hard copies here but also on hive where you can see the games videos of the games bit of description but also see some of the spice levels and if you want to find more about using step then book onto one of our coaching courses the aspiring coaching course actually lo lo goes loads into this and you'll get to play around with it with some uh, like-minded coaches so yep cheers and we'll uh, catch up with you next time <laughs>